Hey guys, Anand Chimpy from Anantech.com here. This is the Anantech Mobile Show brought to you by Intel Mobile. We are live from Google I.O. Uh, this is day two. Um, I've got a bit more information that I want to clarify from yesterday's video and add some new information. Um, so the big news today is uh, we got our Android Wear devices. So this is the LG G Watch. Uh, it's going to retail for about $230, available in early June. Um, internally, real quick, hardware is very, very similar to what's in the Galaxy Gear Live, the Samsung device. Uh, so we're talking about an MSM8026. So it's a modemless quad-core Cortex A7. Um, I don't actually know how many of those cores are active. My guess is not all four are. Um, I've been poking around with the device. I've only had it for a few hours. Um, so I, I haven't really figured out all the little nooks and crannies of what's going on underneath the hood yet. But um, so yeah, get this uh, quad core Cortex A7. I think it's very interesting, but also not unexpected that we are using, you know, effectively off the shelf uh, silicon for this thing. Long term, I see, uh, you know, if wearables do take off, um, I see a, a, a clear shift to, you know, you got to do custom silicon, right? Just like you had to do in the smartphone space uh, for those things to um, to really be optimal for their usage models for their battery life. Uh, we did have to do custom silicon. We're not seeing that done yet, just because that market doesn't really exist yet. Um, so it makes the sense. It makes sense to use off-the-shelf hardware. Uh, in the coming weeks, I do want to do a piece on Cortex M, uh, which is um, potentially a, a more tailor fit design for for something like a watch or a wearable. Um, but that's 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 for later. Uh, so I've been carrying around the G3. Um, <clears throat> uh, the G3 is the phone, and, and using it with um, LG's G Watch. Uh, and man, it's been a long time since I've worn a watch. Uh, my wrist feels heavy. Like I, I just, I stopped wearing watches once I started carrying smartphones around. Um, or actually even before then, right? When, when I was just carrying around a dumb phone, uh, I would always check it for the time. Uh, and I've, I've definitely found that, you know, I'm, I'm pulling my phone out less. Uh, that, that absolutely happens. You know, I dual carry LG's G3 as well as an iPhone 5S, um, if I were only carrying around one device, I would definitely pull out my phone a lot less. Uh, the problem is right now, obviously, um, Android Wear only works with Android. Uh, so any messages that come in over iMessage to my iPhone, uh, I'm still pulling out that device. But uh, I'm, I'm definitely checking my phone a lot less. Um, and it's perfect for environments like Google I.O. where I'm in a meeting or I'm in a, a briefing or, you know, I'm, I'm otherwise occupied and it's pseudo rude to pull out my cell phone. You know, I just glance at the watch and... Real quick, I can tell, hey, is this email or is this uh, a Gchat message? Is it important? Is it something that's, you know, I can interrupt what I'm doing and, and uh, pull out my phone? So I, I, I'm not sold on, hey, everyone needs to go out and buy uh, a wearable or a, a, an Android Wear device, but I see huge potential here, right? I'm, I'm, uh, I don't want to say I'm a convert, but I'm definitely not as negative on the idea of having an Android Wear device as I was uh, kind of prior to using it. Um, real quick in terms of the interface, so this is the watch itself. Um, you can see it's a bit thick here, right? And what this is, is this is the charging back. Um, so it's magnetic. And uh, you see there are a handful of contacts here, and they mate with the contacts on the back of the, the watch here. Um, gives you a little micro USB port, um, and you can use that to charge the device. Uh, this is effectively running Android, right? So you can actually enable developer, developer tools um, and enable debug mode, and you can go in and uh, ADB into it. You can install applications. So I've, I've actually put on a whole bunch of benchmarks. So I don't know if you can see that here. Uh, we've got Chrome on there. I've got Basemark OS 2. These are full Android applications. Um, we've got GFX Bench. Um, so all of that stuff is on here. Uh, None of it can really complete. Um, I, you know, I, I think uh, there there are system limitations to that. But the idea is that you know uh, Google really wants you as a developer to ship a single APK that maybe has a embedded wearable app inside of it, uh, and you know just by installing that APK on your phone, the wearable component gets pushed over to your device. Uh, there are a few official ones that are on here already. Um, so there's like a Compass app. Uh, there is a fit app so here's the compass and right, so it's just a, a quick little example of a wearable app um, 
But the idea is, yeah, you, you ship a single APK that'll work on a phone, a tablet, a TV, and hey, if you know it makes sense for you to have a wearable component in that app as well, well, that wearable component, which um, as soon as you install the the actual app on your phone, it gets pushed over and updated on your uh, on your Android Wear device kind of seamlessly. Um, it makes tons of sense. I, I think uh, you know from a platform perspective, Google's done an excellent job in in. Uh, kind of laying the foundation for Android Wear. Now it's going to be up to its partners and developers to make sure that one, the devices are really good, and two, there are compelling apps for it. You know, today it's it's really a uh, uh, it's a notification assistant, which is nice. I just don't know a lot of people that are going to pay two hundred thirty or two hundred bucks for it if you go with the Samsung device. Um, and it's you know it's not the prettiest thing in the world. Uh, it's not bad. It just makes me feel like you know I just got something that's really cool from the eighties. On the notification front, I talked about Android L yesterday. Uh, one of the things I didn't talk about is the redone notification engine in Android. Um, so notifications on the lock screen are a big deal. Uh, heads up notifications, notifications that you know kind of uh, would normally be full screen apps. So let's say you're playing a game and you get a phone call today. What happens is the phone call takes over your entire device. Uh, with Android L, the ideal usage model is. Um, that full screen notification would just appear as a little heads up notification at the top of your display. You can choose to interact with it or just kind of cast it aside and continue doing what you were doing. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and then, you know, the notification shade is still there. Uh, there's some UI tweaks and stuff like that. But a lot of the interesting stuff I learned about what L means for notifications is Google's really encouraging a lot of its developers to start including metadata with notifications. The, the challenge here is prioritization. Um, since all your notifications are getting pushed to this device, uh, today they just kind of all go there. So, you know, emails get grouped in, pushed over there. Any, you know, Google chat requests I get, uh, those are pushed over there. Uh, and it's nice. Um, and I've, I've limited, you know, in the Android Wear Companion app on Android, you can limit which applications are allowed to notify your, your Android Wear device, which is nice. But ideally what will happen is, based on context, location, what you're doing, what have you, uh, and, and based on time of day and, and all this other stuff, that'll determine what notifications get pushed to you and, and which ones are, are kind of silenced for now. Uh, for example, uh, you know, if I'm driving to a dinner meeting and I get a cancellation at the meeting, you know, ideally that'll float up here and I'll know what's going on. The problem is there's no good way of programmatically doing that, right? So one of the things that Google is really encouraging at I.O. is developers for developers to start including metadata in their notifications. Um, you know, and, and the idea here is that long term, Google will be able to more intelligently prioritize notifications. And I think this is a huge step in the evolution of not only the smartphone platform, but, but definitely just Android in general. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised with uh, if we get to a point where um, applications built around L uh, might give Google enough, uh, where, where they get to a point where Google has enough data where, you know, maybe the next release of Android or, or some intermediate release, or we start seeing more sophisticated prioritization of notifications. Um, I think that's that's definitely one of the key features in L that, you know, I, I think the user facing side of it is definitely like this, uh, you know, hey, notifications look different. Um, but the real meat behind it is, uh, you know, encouraging developers to push this metadata to, to really help Google prioritize notifications. So I think if you want to see what, what one of the, I guess, the long-term game with the, uh, what the Android L notification changes are, it, it's really prioritization. Um, and, and then that plays perfectly into, uh, uh, into the Wear device. Uh, in terms of using the Wear device itself, I mean, it's just like a normal watch. Um, you got this flexible strap. It's all right. Uh, again, I haven't worn a watch in, in years. Um, I was sitting in one of the meetings today and my just wrist was sweaty. And, and granted, it was like a, uh, a crowded room and, and it definitely wasn't cool in there. Um, but it's, it's just little things like this where I'm like, uh, you know, I, I remember the benefits of giving up a watch and, and just having notifications on my wrist are, are definitely not enough to, to pull me back into it. Uh, but I, I, I see the potential. Um, navigation's a bit frustrating. Uh, I always feel like I'm, I'm handcuffed with the device a bit. Uh, generally speaking, what you do is you, you swipe um, up and down to, to kind of get to new cards. Um, you can see I've got uh, a notification here from, from Josh. Uh, and if you want to dismiss it, you just um, swipe left to right. So you've got, uh, and then that's that's the that's the only thing I'm running right now. That's the only notification I have. Um, so up and down to get to different cards, left and right to go deeper into each one. Uh, Google Now integration is obviously a big deal. Um, there are no buttons on this device, so you kind of tap it to bring this up. Um, 
and there's a bunch of predefined things that you can ask the device here. Uh, you can set timers, set alarms, you can clear alarms. Uh, you can do all that through navigating through this little menu here. Uh, if you hit the start button at the bottom of the list, that's how you launch individual applications. Um, and if you go into the settings menu, uh, that's how you uh, restart the device. Uh, again, no buttons. There's like a little dimple here that you can, you know, kind of hit with a pin and that'll reset and turn on the device on and off. Um, but otherwise, there's a, a soft reset button in here. Um, you can also go into about and enable developer options just like you can on an Android device. Um, you swipe left to right to go back, and, and that's pretty much it. Uh, Overall, the experience isn't bad. Um, again, I, I, I don't see this being the, the type of thing that everyone's going to rush out and kind of buy, um, but I absolutely see potential in it. Um, so it's, it's definitely something to watch out for. Um, I, I think the Moto 360 is the, the watch that everyone's really, really interested in, um, and Google mentioned that that's, that's going to be shipping later this summer. Uh, so that's kind of the, the Android Wear update. A couple other things that I wanted to fill in some blanks on that we talked about yesterday. So ART, the, the new Android runtime that's a, that's a part of L, um, the default and only Android runtime in, in L release. Uh, I spent a little bit of time in a session with Google today where I kind of understood a little bit more about how it works architecturally. Uh, one of the major, major changes uh, is, is the way ART does garbage collection. So if you look at how Dalvik works today, uh, or, or even how art works in KitKat today. You have, uh, every time you run a garbage collection routine, which is quite frequently within the OS, uh, there are kind of two required pauses in that routine. Uh, and these are pauses where Dalvik comes in, uh, suspends all running threads, all, all application threads, all VM threads, suspends all of them, uh, runs one component of garbage collection thread, does some more work after it unsuspends all of that stuff, pauses again, suspends all of those same threads, does a little bit more work, unpauses, and, and does some concurrent work. Those two pauses, uh, one, they, you know, obviously they interrupt workflow, uh, and two, they can actually take a decent amount of time. So Google gave an example of those two pauses taking roughly 10 milliseconds um, in, in a single application. So if you look at trying to maintain a 60 frames per second frame rate, a 10 millisecond pause you know, if you want to hit 60 frames a second, each frame gives you about 16 milliseconds of time to render. If 10 milliseconds of that 16 is spent being paused doing garbage collection uh, uh, work, it leaves you six milliseconds to do the rest of the work and paint the screen and push it out. Uh, and, and that's how we end up with jank and stutter and, and drops in frame rate. Um, Google gave another example, uh, I believe a Google Maps example, where uh, it was a particularly bad garbage collection situation, or actually, no, sorry, this wasn't a Google Maps example. This was a, uh, a, a garbage collection on Malik example. Um, but regardless, you, you had a situation where uh, the GC routines resulted in a 50 millisecond, 50 millisecond plus uh, pause time. And that translates into a minimum of three dropped frames. Uh, and this is where jank comes from, right? This is where you see uh, a reduction in smoothness. So with art on L release, uh, those two pauses I talked about, the first one's gone. Um, what happens is uh, uh, Art will effectively ask the apps to do a little bit of the work on their own time without pausing all the threads um, to, to kind of mitigate the need for that first pause. The second pause is there, but there's some new garbage collection routines that help reduce the duration of that pause. So that 10 millisecond example um, you know, I gave you before, you, know, you see that 10 milliseconds reduced in roughly half. Uh, so that definitely frees up um, the, the platform to, to have an easier time hitting 60 frames a second. Uh, so this is a huge deal, and, and the best place you see it manifested in is actually the Google Play application, uh, the, the Play Store application, which has been you know notori notoriously bad in terms of uh, just performance when scrolling. Uh, so with, with Art in an L release, uh, that should be substantially better. Um, and, and I think hopefully uh, these improvements in, in uh, garbage collection performance will result in, you know, kind of, again, any application targeting L should be much smoother, should deliver a much better overall user experience um, than, than any of the previous ones. Now, again, apps that don't get updated, uh, you know, they're, 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 the beauty of art is that the developer doesn't really have to do much. Um, so a lot of these benefits will, will kind of come naturally and come for free. Um, but I, I think with L, you're going to see uh, just at a high level, uh, anyone targeting this is, is going to help really make the platform overall a lot better. 
Uh, and this actually boils down to some of the, uh, or, or uh, builds upon some of the ideas that we talked about yesterday with uh, the job scheduler API and improving battery life and overall performance. Um, so Google didn't really hammer home the idea that, hey, look, this, this L release is really better for the platform and the ecosystem as a whole, but that's really what's happening here. Anyone that targets L um, and, and this foundation we have with L, I think is going to make Android um, substantially better uh, going forward. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is a feature that um, Google talked about with regards to Chromecast. And the idea is that today when you uh, want to control your Chromecast device, uh, you've got to be on the same Wi-Fi network. Um, you know, so your mobile device and, and the Chromecast device eventually have to be on the same Wi-Fi network. Uh, but what happens if your friend comes over and wants to control your Chromecast device, uh, your Chromecast attached to your TV, for example? You either have to give them the Wi-Fi password uh, or get them a guest account or something. But either way, it's a, it's a disruption in the user's model. Um, so Google came up with a, kind of an alternative solution. And it's kind of neat, um, which is why I want to talk about it here. Uh, so the way it works is this. Um, let's say your friend comes over, he's not on your Wi-Fi network, he has cellular connectivity, so he's on, you know, uh, he has cloud access effectively. With this update to Chromecast, the way it works is Google will use Android location services to determine whether or not you're within, you're nearby a Chromecast device. If you are, you'll get, you know, the little overflow button that says, hey, look, you can, you can push your display out to uh, a Chromecast, there's one nearby. Uh, the pairing process is what's really cool. In order to pair without Wi-Fi, pair over the cloud, what happens is if it detects that you're within range of this device and you say, and the device is enabled support for this, you know, enable streaming to nearby devices or streaming from nearby devices. Uh, when you attempt to connect, the TV will actually push out an ultrasonic sound um, uh, notification, an ultrasonic code uh, through its speakers. If your phone picks it up, uh, which means that it's within earshot of, of your TV, then the authentication happens and, and you're now paired and can control that device. This prevents the situation where, you know, your next door neighbor uh, tries to pair his phone to your, your TV. Um, in the event that your TV is off or it's muted or something like that, there's a visual exchange of the pin code. So the pin code will be displayed on background and you got to type it in um, and, and kind of that's the alternative. Uh, it's super neat. I, I don't know if it's going to take off. I don't know if it's you know the future of anything. But I, I I've just never seen a uh, an ultrasonic exchange of an authentication code before. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, I've got one last session to go to at Google I/O before I'm kind of done here. Uh, so I'm going to do that now. Um, I'll be writing up a lot of this stuff over the next couple of days. I want to thank you all for listening. Thank you all for reading and watching uh, uh, our, our Google I/O updates over the past couple of days. Thanks, guys.